Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Leveled Up Podcast. I'm Nick. And I'm Ash. How you been? I've been really good, actually. Yeah? It's been nice. Good weather, good friends, just hanging. That's good. How you doing? I'm doing good. We've had two of these episodes now. This is this is, uh, this is the number one. three. Yeah. Uh, what do you think so far? How's... I'm excited. I, I'm really enjoying it. I'm enjoying it a lot. How's the format working? I think it's good. Okay, well, yeah. this week we're flipping it around, so <laughs> yeah, we forget are. that. Forget about that. This one's a different one. Yeah. Uh, this week, Ash and I are actually talking about a game that Ash had played before and I had not. Mm-hmm. Um, we had talked about wanting to do a couple of these episodes, and while we mm-hmm. were thinking of games uh, that we wanted to record, we had some footage for a couple other games, and then Ash started talking about this one that we're going we're gonna to say, um, and I decided that it was a quick enough game. I would jump in and play it, and then you could kind of guide most of the conversation about it. Yeah. Uh, believe it or not, I would like to put this in history. I showed Nick a game, and he, he enjoyed it. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> I enjoy most games. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. You are pretty easy. Yeah. <clears throat> um, hey. <laughs> let's get into this. Okay. So the game I will be talking about today is an adventure puzzle game that was released in September 2018. Oh, it's okay. Not that old. No, it's not. Not at all. Uh, this really fun game is called The Gardens Between. Right. The Gardens Between. Yeah. Um, like I said, it's an adventure puzzle game. It was created by Voxel Agents, who is an Australian game studio. Okay. They also make the Train Conductor games. Okay. Um, I, I have no I idea what kind of games those are, but I, I know those. they have multiple of Train Conductor games. Do they? Games. Yep. They must be good then. Sure. Okay. Um. Yeah, I was really surprised after looking at that that they made Gardens Between. Sure. sure. But yeah, that's a, another story. Um, a little background on me. Uh, I actually played this game spring of 2019. Um, for no other reason than it was on sale. To be honest. You got it on the Switch though. It's important I did. to note. Yeah, sorry. I All did three get of these the games Switch. have been on the Switch so far. Yeah. Get some promo from Nintendo or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> Nintendo send me free stuff. Uh, please. Um, but yeah, I got it on sale at the time. The trailer looked really, really cool. Uh, I've said it before on the podcast where I'm very, I gravitate very strongly to games that are captivating to my eyes. As long as they mm. look beautiful, it's really hard for me to say no. So the second I saw the price go down and I was in the market for a new game, I had to go for it. Um, have you even heard of the game, Nick? Had you had heard of it before yes. I brought it up? I There are a couple indie outlets that when we were game design students, we were basically required to follow mm-hmm. um, and see other kind of indie developers publishing stuff. So I had heard that this game was in the works. I didn't actually know when it had come out or if it had come out. Um, the only thing that I knew is that it was in development and it was supposed to be this story puzzle-like game. Um, And then, of course, it came out and you played it, and that's when I actually heard that it was out um, and heard more about it, but I didn't follow its development. All right, second question. Okay. Why did it take you over a year to play it after I told you about it? Okay. Um, Well, you know I like almost all genres of games, and I say almost because I put sports at the very bottom of that category. (laughs) Just can't get into them. Uh, Just like real life. Doesn't Nintendo have a tennis game? Okay, Mario Tennis does not count. (laughs) That's a great game. The Olympic ones? Yeah, I don't don't think that they could fit in the sports category. They're they're too fun. Um, I don't typically go for... uh, I don't buy a lot of story games. Um, Like Journey. I also hadn't bought or played Journey up until the point where we played it together. And I knew that it was fantastic. You know, we actually learned a ton about it in uh, our classes. But I had never picked it up. Because those are kind of games that I like to hear about and I like to watch someone else play on YouTube or mm-hmm. watching you play. Um, but it wasn't something that I wanted to actively go out and seek, even though I knew that it would be something that I would enjoy because there's a ton of other masochistic games like <laughs> Enter the Gungeon that I like to <laughs> spend all of my time in. Nice. Um, for all of you who haven't heard of The Gardens Between or it's been a while, I'll give you a quick um, summarized synopsis that I uh, try to whip together. Me being very professional like in this podcast. Whipped cream. All right. Um, <laughs> so, The Gardens Between takes you through the journey of Arena and Friend in their friendship. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Real quick. I know I'm going to break the synopsis. It's fine. I was really excited. 
Arena and Friend? Yes. Are these, like, typical Australian names? I thought that was your thing to research. Was it? Okay, give me, keep going. <laughs> um, after a strong rainstorm, you two are shipwrecked into a world of mysterious gardens. Throughout the levels, you can tell that the world has grown around the memories and objects of their past. Starting from when Arena moved into the neighborhood, all of the game nights, movie nights, and fun times shared up until the sad ending of when Front moved out. Together, they manipulate time by traveling forwards and backwards to go through the story of them. It takes you and the characters through their memories so that you can learn the true depth and meaning of their friendship. See, I feel like someone should hire me after that. To, <laughs> to read synopsis? Yeah. Is? I can make a great synopsis. That yeah, was great. That was really good. Just saying. Actually, yeah. I, if anyone um, was confused, I think they now have the full concept. We could probably stop talking about it. I think you just nailed the entire that's game. That's all, folks. All right. Thank you. You just... No, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, uh, you know, basic two friends trying to go through the past of their memories. Um, a big part of when I was researching about the development, and yes, I actually did this part, which is, <laughs> you know, crazy. Uh, I like learning about it, but I'm sure Nick will talk to you about what all this really means. Um, <laughs> I learned that the lead designer and animator, his name is Josh Bradbury. Yes. Um, He's a cool dude. He said that the game was meant to be an allegory for how someone looks back at childhood friends as they age. Mm. How like you, you look at it and it's kind of muffled. So uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but the main core mechanic of this game is time manipulation. Yes. Um, and how the reason why it was the core mechanic is because they wanted to show you trying to relive childhood memories by like running back and forth on, in order to recall them correctly, um, which I thought was super cool and a really um, strong reasoning to have that as such a core mechanic. Like, yeah. And just playing the game, I, I never... I obviously caught that it was like the story of their friendship and you know you're going through some weird world by learning um elements of their friendship right but i never really put two and two together until i read this and watched you play of hey this is it, two people who when they were young were very different personalities you can tell in the game that arena is much more outgoing mm -hmm. and open to adventure while friend uh, much it closed off um introverted how they're kind of looking back at their story of their friendship and being like why were we friends to begin with you know like what made this um friendship so powerful and it takes you through that journey i just so the name arena mm -hmm. from what i could find it is slavic but it actually comes from the greek goddess arena uh meaning peace um i don't know if that's what they were going for friend nothing um, it could actually just be a play on friend. Um, which yeah, is... uh, German was close, kind of. Yeah. Friend. Um, arena in Spanish is sand. Okay, we got that's all I got. Sand friend. Hey. Yep. Um, all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're you're very right about uh, the time manipulation and and learning more about their characters. I think it was one of the coolest things when I was jumping into the game. Uh, even just the way they walk, you can tell very quickly. Like Arena takes the lead almost immediately. Um, and it's weird because when you manip manipulate time, you can move left and right and then the characters will follow. And I thought it was super interesting that this might be one of the only games I've ever played where you don't control the characters. You control the world around the characters, mm -hmm. which was crazy. Yeah. I remember opening it and I was like, okay, oh, why can't I, you know, I was trying to move uh, Arena left and right and it wasn't, it was spinning the world, the island that you, you go to uh forward and backwards in time and i was like okay so i have to interact with the world and then the characters just kind of follow suit which is very cool yeah i mean i thought it's super interesting to see a game like that and um from the little knowledge i have i mean i haven't seen many games do that with time manipulation um i want to know how you felt about how they introduced the idea of manipulating time and if you felt how easy was it to learn and grasp with the mechanics of the game sure uh, from a story perspective, it was weird. You know, I, I will say that. Because the beginning of the game, like you were saying, Arena and Frent are in the top of the treehouse, presumably on the night before Frent is leaving the neighborhood. Childhood friends, he's moving out. They're both really sad about it. Um, so they're kind of looking back on all of their memories, and the game actually plays through their memories in an exaggerated fashion. Um, 
But I thought it was really weird because like the storm gets much worse and then all of a sudden the like a random flash flood and then in like a dreamlike state they both wake up on an island where uh, Arena finds this lantern. Um, you know, it, it's one of the main mechanics of the game. And then immediately you find out that by moving the joystick left and right, that just manipulates time. I was hoping there'd be a little more of a, a contextual reason for why mm -hmm. time could be manipulated like that, or even just having the motif be an hourglass or something like that, rather than what it was. Yeah. Um, but the actual mechanic, like once you get into it, it's one of the easiest things, I mean, that you can pick up, right? Because you know, pushing the joystick forward, everything just goes forward in time, and then backwards is everything rewinding in time. So I think I sat on the first level for maybe 10 minutes just going back and forth and back and forth and watching like, I think it's books or something fall right at the beginning or some driftwood and you can just bring it back up to the top and send it flying again mm -hmm. and back up to the top. Um, but that's it for the entire game is just left and right manipulating time and hitting A interacts with various interactables. Yeah. But it's very, very simple as a puzzle game should be. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of brought it up actually. Uh, one of my favorite things about this game, obviously the time manipulation, so cool. But the fact that you interact with the world and those interactions stick no matter uh, whether you're traveling forward or backwards. Um, did you like that that happened or like were there some fun um scenes in the levels that stood out to you that really helped you go through yeah i think actually from a design perspective what people want in puzzle games is to be able to figure things out right uh you want to look for that logic and say okay i know what i have to do here finally the puzzle makes sense to me so with time manipulation that actually kind of tricks the player's brain, which is a really cool design trick because things that you do as you figure them out stay locked in place. So a lot of other puzzle games, like something like Portal, uh, you have to go through and it takes a lot of trial and error to kind of figure out um, and, and get your way through the level. But in a game like this, which is still a puzzle game, uh, a lot of the time being manipulated kind of mirrors your step-by-step -step process of going through it, like getting them from point A to point B, and then as you pause to take a breath, the game literally stops. It stops time until you want it to flash forward again, mm -hmm. which is very, very cool for, for a puzzle game to do uh, to, to make a puzzle player feel like they're actually solving it, um, which is a very, very nice design uh, trick. Mm -hmm. Do you like puzzle games? I do. Um, I played, I did, never actually played the original Portal, I know, but uh, I played Portal 2, uh, which was very fun. We played a little bit of that together, uh, which was very enjoyable. Um, I enjoy puzzle games. Again, I don't, they're not the genre that I actively seek out to play on the norm, but I think it's, it's very mm -hmm. fun to do so. And I guess like on the same vein, designing games Two questions. What okay. is your favorite game, type of game to design, but do you think you would enjoy designing a puzzle game? Because I know you have a fun, I would say, level creating, fun fantasy creating <laughs> mind, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, I, I would love to be able to, I think making logic puzzles are so much fun because for me and someone that plays Dungeons and Dragons, it's a lot more fun to watch players figure it out, right? when you set something up and then you watch as your players kind of struggle with it for a little bit and then there's that moment where it clicks. That's mm -hmm. very satisfying to be able to do. Um, I don't know if that's that's my favorite kind of design to do is puzzle design. Um, I really like designing rhythm stuff actually, uh, which is I guess a little bit harder, but I really, really like syncing things to the beat and then watching it play out. Uh, which is, I guess, a little different than this, but... Mm -hmm. uh, I know when I was playing it, I was really... I, I'm not going to say the word addicted. Um, I really wanted to finish it in one go. I, I didn't. I know I didn't at the time, but um, it's really hard to put down because yeah. it's a, such a compelling story in a not-in-your-face way, I guess is the best way for Very me to true. put it. And... I even watching you like I could remember those puzzles that took me a little longer like there's uh, a scene where you have to move a water droplet to electrocute some lamps and seeing Nick do it almost like brought warmth to my heart so I was like <laughs> I remember when I did it and I was sitting in bed and it took me forever or 
there's a one level where you know you're going up and down an elevator and you have to manipulate the elevator to get your uh, bulbs of light to the right place um so so incredibly clever and then all of course the little things like there was one where you had to um encode into a machine oh, by pressing yeah. different numbers i would never think of doing that um and when I was first, and just like you did, uh, when you first go through the level, you don't think of, oh, these numbers mean anything. I'm just going to keep going until it all clicks. Uh, do you have a favorite uh, level that you played or the one that stuck <clears throat> out? Yeah, I think actually I really, really enjoyed the paint level, uh, which Ooh, is a level a where the little hopper boxes that you kind of meet, uh, um, Arena can place her... I don't know what it is, like lantern, I guess, yeah. spirit lantern, on them, and then it carries them through the level so you can pick it back up later. Memory lantern, one might say. Memory memory lantern, I guess so. Um, but there's one level where you're going through and a couple of the hopper boxes jump in a, a, a couple different buckets of paint, and then they all kind of line up, and you have to place the lantern in the correct one. Mm. So when you rewind time, they jump all the way back to the light orb, so it collects the light orb. Which was actually really, really cool because at first there's only like two or three um, and you have to actively watch. You kind of fast forward and rewind time a bunch to, to track each individual hopper box. Um, and then as soon as you do the first one, you go higher up the mountain and all of the hopper boxes keep going up um, and you get more and more added onto it. So then it's by the so end of the fun. level, there's like five or six and there's orange paint and purple paint and blue paint. So fun. That was a really, really satisfying level. Thank you for bringing that back into my memory. Yeah. I That was a great one. Um, I'm gonna get deep. Yeah, you recently told me since you've recently played it that the the ending kind of hit you a little hard. Do you yeah, wanna... I I cried when it ended. Hundred <laughs> percent. Is this new to you crying at the end? Of no, games? no, I cry at the end of every game. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very easy. It's, I don't like endings. Um, yes, yeah, the ending was really rough because this is a game designed in, I think, a way like Celeste. And Celeste is a game that you have not played. Nope. I think you've seen me play maybe a little bit of it, or Mitch played a little I bit of Mitch it. I saw Mitch play it. Um, which is a game very cleverly designed about overcoming depression without actually saying that the game is about overcoming depression. You play as a main character trying to climb a mountain and your inner self is kind of battling you the entire time. Um, this is a game about dealing with memories and growing up you know, as as a kid and parting ways with your friend because at the end, you know, Frent leaves, which was incredibly sad. Did you see it coming? No, I mean, in the beginning, it, it hints at the fact that they're kind of sad in that first scene is that someone is leaving or that something is happening. Um, but you do, you kind of forget it as you go through the game because it's constructed in such a beautiful way where each level plays through their memories. But it's not in your face, just like how Celeste does it. The game uh, kind of exaggerates all of their, their memories mm -hmm. into fun, colorful levels that you wouldn't otherwise need to look too deeply into. Um, I know one of them was actually really, really cool. I don't remember if it was the movie night or the game night level, um, where you have to climb up a couple stacks of books, uh, and there's actually a little TV that you have to plug in by manipulating time, and then a little game character jumps out of the TV, oh, and you have to platform a little bit with it, which was really, really cool. But at that point of the game, I wasn't thinking of the, the overarching, you know, mm -hmm. theme that was going on until you get back to the end and you realize that all of the memories you've played through are all of the memories they had together. Um, and that's why there's no more levels. That, that was the sad realization that hit me was as soon as level or world eight, I guess you could call it, ended, that was all of their memories. They, they had no more levels to go through because friend was moving. Their friendship was over. Well, I mean. That's it. it. It, Done. That, that's it. You Done. move away, you lose your friends. Basically. Um, yeah. Well, it, it did look like it was set in, because it was like a SNES, so like the early yeah. 90s. So, um, I was actually thinking about this, and I think, uh, I, I, I have no idea how old the designer the designers were, or the animators, but I think it, the way they alluded to it was looking back at childhood memories. Right, okay. So, uh, they played it off as them thinking about their childhood memories which assuming they were a little older than us yeah okay they're a little older than us so their childhood would be around that time point okay oh i see yeah i see what you're saying would be around that that time frame 
Um, and then as, as you come out of the last level, which by the way, the last level, unfortunately didn't get into the recording is just like a 25 minute climb up this lightning rainstorm spire of rock where all of the memories are crumbling, which is a great, um, I guess, analogy for what's happening, right? They're finally realizing that, that their lives have to come apart and they have to part ways as you watch as their cassettes fall into the ocean and, oh, it's really sad. And then it's bittersweet because at the very end, uh, you watch as Arena and French, they hug like one last time out of the treehouse. Um, and then Frank gets in the moving van and Arena does smile and she kind of waves as he as he uh, drives away. But And then the credits roll. And it was just so sad to watch. They had such... And I, I said this to you. Th this is a little less deep than we were talking about. These were really resourceful kids. <laughs> like, I, they look maybe, I don't know, 12 maybe-ish? Yeah, I'll say that. 13? Um, and they built a treehouse, right? <laughs> they went like sewer exploring. Uh, they they played around and, and almost got caught in a, a museum, like like knocking over artifacts and stuff. They did all sorts of crazy stuff that the game does exaggerate, but uh, it does play it in those cutscenes as well. So I thought that was crazy that these kids were like really go getters, the best of friends, and then they had to part ways, which yeah. was really really sad. It's hard. It did. Yeah, I think. It one of my favorite things that does not happen often is watching you play a game for the first time true okay that i know what's supposed to happen i know what needs to happen but i get to actually see it from your perspective and i can finally see your little light bulbs moving <laughs> <Shuck>. um <laughs> and i think one thing that i learned from nick uh and i never thought of before were secrets in games that's true. I never thought any deeper than this is my level. I'm going to play here. Why would a developer hide things from me? Growing up on Nintendo, that's like gaming 101. Meanies. Either <laughs> way, um, I would say that I haven't, I, I didn't learn this uh, trademark Nick secret about secrets <laughs> until very recently. So I would say before I play, no, after I played this game. Yeah. Little did I know, <laughs> there are secrets in this game. Nick immediately found. <laughs> I'm a little upset about That's it. That's true. Yeah, when you're when you're rewatching the uh, the cutscene. So at the end of each level, it plays the actual memory that happened. You know, the not exaggerated portion of it. And I noticed after playing the museum level that one of the eggs in the background, like a dinosaur egg, was shaking when I was playing through <laughs> the memory. So I rewound time. Because I, I had actually asked you earlier, I said, why can you manipulate time in the cutscene memories? Like, there's nothing yeah. to do there. And here I was. I said, because it looked cool. Yeah. You Stop were, asking questions. I know. You you were like, well, it's just because I feel like that's the main mechanic. So you kind of can manipulate it any way you want. And then I you can move wrong. on. I was wrong. So I took that at face value for a little bit <laughs> until I saw the egg shake. And I was like, no, no, no. So I rewound time until the egg was shaking. And then I stopped. So it froze time. The egg shook out of time and then hatched into one of those little uh, jump boxes that, you know, jumps around. And I was like, you're kidding, right? Th this secret. I was so upset. <laughs> I know, you, you were just like, oh my God, you found a secret. So then I went back through every other memory and found that there was a secret in every single one and then did that going forward as well, um, which was very, very fun. So cool. Very, oh, I wish cool. I had the mind to do that. It was <laughs> crazy. It's, it's, I love when developers put secrets in games like that where it's it's not necessary although i was looking it up we were playing it on the switch there are achievements um on every other really? version yeah because the switch doesn't do achievements for oh, some reason that's really cool so there are achievements for finding all of the little secrets um that you can yeah oh i will say that this game um is available all on all consoles and even in the app store for um iphones and androids which i think is really cool very cool um i would play this it's game on so many platforms on a very uh have you played fez or heard of fez no okay it is basically a 2d version of this game oh um i actually I almost forgot about it it's a really old game um but i i can imagine that this game took oh, a lot of so inspiration cute. oh it's it's adorable it's a pixel art game um where the whole game revolves around you climbing towers but you actually rotate like 90 oh, degrees you know what we're just going to talk about Mitch this entire time. Uh, Mitch brought this game up to me when I was trying to get him to play The Gardens Between. Oh, did he? Hi, Mitch. Thank you for Thanks, bringing Mitch. me into your world. Now, he didn't get this far in the podcast. There's no way. Stupid Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um... I might have to play that next. It's really cool. Yeah, it's a lot longer. Um, okay. And oh, yeah, I the puzzles say, get a lot um, more complicated. What is it? Runtime? Game time? Yeah. Playtime. Playtime. One of the times. This game's about, I would say, two to three hours uh, start to finish. So a pretty easy game to do in one go if you wanted to or split it up. Um, so yeah. If I can just speak to another game mechanic Please, real quick. Please, go for it. Um, so this game is all about manipulating time, which I love as a game mechanic. I love when games let you freeze time and kind of look at the world around you. Some games allow you to rewind time. There's a game called Super Hot where you, the world around you doesn't move unless you do. So you kind of play as this, uh, I want to say almost shooter character. It's like black and white kind of graphics or red and white. And you kind of move, and as you move, everything around you speeds up, oh, and as cool. you slow down, everything around you... You'll know it as the super hot watch from Enter the Gungeon. That's the reason. You get oh, an item, you, really? then nothing moves around you, and then as you start to move, all the bullets keep moving, because that's that's the game that it was from. Um, so Here I, it is, another reason. I know nothing about all things in Gungeon. I Here know. I am learning. Years later. Thank you for coming on this journey with me. <laughs> so... I really like games that do time manipulation. I think it's a fantastic mechanic. I wish more games allowed you to alter the world with time. This game does it very cleverly, so if we can delve a little deeper into this mechanic. When you move the joystick, it moves the world around you. And mm -hmm. like you said, there are certain things that stay put once you actually manipulate them, which is how the game progresses. However, there are also things that move out of time, which is absolutely crazy. A good example that I can give is in one of the last levels, there's one of the hopper boxes mm. that is listening to music. And I don't know if it's because of the music, I haven't been able to figure this out, he can move even when the game is stopped. So if you don't do anything, even on the pause menu, he keeps hopping around in a mm. location. So what you have to do is you have to actually wait, not touch the controller, until he gets where you want it to go, and then you move the world around him so then all of a sudden things can be manipulated. I so I thought that it was crazy that there were things that moved out of time. And another good example, the saw. Oh, in yeah. one of the earlier levels, um, you kind of get blocked by this wall or this path you can't go on, and there's nothing else for you to do. So you're manipulating time left and right and left and right. And then when you finally pause it on the saw, you realize that the saw is trying to cut through the wood. So if you kind of rewind and forward fast a little bit, it continues to cut through the wood. And then finally, it cuts through. Yeah. And then finally, like you were saying, there's a level where water droplets are falling uh, from a pipe, and as they pass through the broken wires, they kind of uh, conduct a little bit of electricity. Mm -hmm. But what the game doesn't tell you is if you stop time once again with the water kind of hanging between the two wires, it conducts a lot more electricity and then turns on the lights for like seven seconds. So it's weird that these things happen out of time, and I thought that that was really cool because as you're playing through the game, you start to recognize the loop, the pattern mm -hmm. that these levels do. You stop time when you want to, you know, uh, interact with things. You move left to rewind time, and things rebuild. You move right to forward, you know, to, to speed up time, and you watch as things break. And then, as you get further in the game, the game tries to throw some curveballs at you by saying, hey, there's one more facet of time you forgot about, and that's being out of time. These things that don't necessarily have to ha have to happen while the timeline is moving which is crazy because you can almost look at it in in a fourth dimension kind of way right mm -hmm. where you have this linear timeline where you can move back and forth left and right and then it starts moving laterally like you know forward and backwards as well um where other things are happening like the electricity is passing through the water so i just thought that that was a very very clever use of time that i didn't expect until i had to you know stop using time and watch what would happen out of time yeah so that was a very very cool design choice on their part really fun to hear you explain that yeah yeah wow sorry i'm just in awe that's really cool <laughs> it was very cool um one of the last big things i wanted to bring up uh was uh, something i, mean, I was talking about you brought me into light is the actual music behind Ooh. this game yeah um so there is uh, the composer, his name is Tim Scheel. He is mm -hmm. an Australian composer. I think he does a lot of like EDM music. Um, either way, I looked really uh, far into it. He used to be a, a radio show host as well. He's really cool. So, um, 
I really started to pay attention to the music when I was watching you play, and I thought it was really, really impactful. Mm -hmm. There was a, so much emotion into everything he put into that. So when I started looking him up, obviously he is all about finding and doing emotional trajectory trajectories. <laughs> sorry, of sound. So he. It is his thing to capture emotion in his sound really? music. Really? Okay. Which, awesome. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, how did you feel? Oh, it was beautiful. It's one of those games where it's really not overpowering, but with almost nothing else going on for sound effects, except for like the little dings of when you interact with things. You just feel like you're on a journey, mm -hmm. which, funnily enough, is exactly how the game Journey does it as well. Oh, I love Journey. Um, where there's these sweeping, flowing soundtracks, uh, which are absolutely beautiful, which help tell the story as you kind of go along. Um, I thought it was really, really pretty. You know, it's it's one of those things where it just kind of sets you in an ambient mood, mm -hmm. um, peaceful. Calming. Calming, yeah. very calming, uh, which is absolutely gorgeous until <laughs> the credits when I was crying and they decided to throw some really depressing lyrics in there, like, I will never forget you if you never forget me. And I started crying even harder because I was really not expecting the uh, the game to twist like that, just like Transistor does when they throw lyrics uh, into their very emotional songs, and I, I can't handle it. Um, but it was... I mean, the music in any game like this is supposed to tell the story as well. It's all part of what's called environmental storytelling. Because you can tell a story in a whole bunch of different ways with a narrative. Uh, you can literally throw it at the players with like text on a screen. You can have a whole bunch of cutscenes, or you can do one of the trickiest ways, and that is environmental storytelling. Mm -hmm. That's using things like the actual environment around you, the nature, the world that you go through, the music, the sound effects, the lighting, everything except the characters to tell the story, which games don't do well very often, but there are a lot of games that have done it, right? Journey is a fantastic one. There's, I think, zero or almost zero text in that game, right? Wasn't that the whole point? Yeah. Um, and the whole world is told, the whole world, the whole story is told from environmental storytelling. Another great one is Limbo. Um, oh, I need to play that. Which, again, is a silent game and tells the entire story through what's going on in the background, the music that you can hear, environmental storytelling. Unraveled. Unraveled is another that, fantastic yeah. one that's a silent one, uh, which is actually quite similar to this one with, yeah. with a two-player kind of memory-esque uh, game to play. Um, where everything that's going on in the background, the sound effects, the music you hear, they take you on the journey. Mm -hmm. It's it's much more of an environmental storytelling, which is a very, very cool way to do story uh, in a video game, but you don't see it in a lot of AAA titles because people are expecting cinematics nowadays, mm -hmm. right? In, for example, in the new Last of Us game, The Last of Us 2, you wouldn't jump into that game and expect the entire world to just tell the story itself. You need Ellie in those cutscenes. You need those cutscenes to actually tell the story. The Call of Duty games, for example. Yeah. Their stories are fantastic, but it's because they're told like a movie. You know, mm -hmm. they're they're written like a movie, they're told like a movie. So I think that that is a really cool and unique way to do storytelling that I wish more games would take a stab at. But I guess also because they don't, it's a good breath of fresh air. Yeah. After playing something heavy, um, like The Witcher or Call of Duty, or coming from like a very popular title that throws a lot of plot at you and a lot of cutscenes... Uh, for me, I've been playing a lot of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 recently, really trying to finish it. Um, and that game has a lot of cutscenes and so many plot threads. So to step back and to just let the world tell me a simple story of these are their memories, you can figure out what's going on, it's it's a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if we've told uh, the listeners this yet, but Nick over here is a beautiful audio designer. Uh, he actually wrote... Um, and composed the soundtrack for his recent game that he was part of developing, which honestly beautiful, and I hope he puts it in the description so everyone can see down below because beautiful work he did. Um, All right, thank you, Ash. You'll get your 20 bucks after this. <laughs> Thanks for the plug there. Not paid advertising. Yeah, not paid advertising. Um, and because of that, would this have been a game that you would have enjoyed being the composer on? Like, would, would you have enjoyed being in charge oh, of the geez. soundtrack? It's so much pressure to do an ambient soundtrack like this that's supposed to drive the storytelling. Because I, 
the the soundtrack that I did compose for that's on Steam was supposed to be more of a background. It wasn't supposed to tell the story. It was supposed to be ambient, but in no way was it supposed to kind of push the game forward in any direction. It was supposed to just fit the theme. Mm -hmm. I would love to give it a shot, but I don't know if I would want that pressure um, that Shiel had on this project mm -hmm. of being like, music is one of the main driving factors of this. So to, to compose themes, Ori in the Blind Forest is another fantastic one that I know you still have to play, but the music in that is just so swelling and pushing for the entirety of the game, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, I think if I had access to a symphony orchestra like he did for the game Duet, uh, the Queensland Symphony Orchestra, he actually used to compose that game's music, um, then I would have a lot more fun doing it. But I think if I was tasked with like writing the soundtrack for this kind of game, in my current state, no. <laughs> I don't think I'd like the pressure to do it. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. That's a lot of pressure on you. Um, something I really wanted to point out that I thought was so cool to see a game studio and um, a music artist do together is obviously, I mean, they created this project. They created the Gardens Between, but they actually created a, a side project called Relax in the Gardens Between. Did they? Yeah, it is um, all about, um, it's a contemplative and relaxing audiovisual experience. They combine scenes from the garden between, uh, for what I can assume, scenes that um, didn't necessarily make it into the game, or they um, fletched them out a little more, and they added his music to the back of it. So they're just three slow trailers that um are really just meant to calm you down so along with the actual game they brought this cool experience to you that i think really speaks to who Sheil is as a, a writer and what he's passionate about which i thought was super cool um and apparently i think this might have came out a little earlier than the actual game and there are actually little secrets in it which you can tell you about the game which i think is awesome so i actually have uh, a little bit of a story to tell about this All right. kind of system so in a lot of cinema and a lot of game scores um music composers are hired they're usually not uh on staff or you know part of the the company at least in triple a studios or in you know film uh, -huh. uh you hire someone who is a composer um to be able to write all the music for you and score the movie or the game what happens a lot of the time is uh, directors and producers say, okay, this is what we're looking for. We need you to write these themes. We haven't filmed it yet. We haven't created the game yet. This is what we're looking for. And can you do this? And it goes out to composers and they write all of the pieces and they say, hey, does this sound good? The people at the studio listen to it and they you know, make adjustments or they say, yeah, that sounds great. We're going to put it in. And then that's it. A lot of composers actually don't compose wow. to the uh, scores or to the actual film or games themselves. They just kind of get outsourced and then bam, they get written as music, they get performed and then they get shipped back to the studio so they can get plugged into the game. Um, which works for a lot of very famous uh, composers because they have a lot of music to write and a lot of stuff to do. I cannot remember what composer it was off the top of my head, but a very famous composer uh, throughout the 80s and 90s actually wrote so many pieces of music um, for movies. He would literally send them off and had famous uh, lines saying, I didn't even get to watch the movie. Like I never even watched, I never heard my music wow. because I just sent my music to the movie and then that was it. Like I just, I knew it was in there and, and never even watched it. Um, but what happens in a lot of these indie games is the composer works directly with the designers, which happens in some films as well. And you can tell, right? Especially in films, here's a good example like Baby Driver. Oh, yeah. You know for a fact that that composer was working directly with the directors and producers on that project because music played a huge part. In a game like this, you know that uh, Shiel was working with the designers to be able to naturally compose the game and actually have some influence on how it turned out. Yeah, a one uh, that I wanted to bring up that you made me, rem you reminded me of, excuse me, uh, Detroit Become Human. Mm -hmm. I thought it was the coolest thing. They actually, so... Uh, we'll just briefly there are three main characters yep. in the game and they actually brought in three separate composers they did for to each write, character uh, a different soundtrack 
for each character and they like they worked with them they taught them about what the character was and what their scenes would be like and they wrote the music yep. for that and it's it's breathtaking when that magic comes together yes and that's what more studios should do but alas it's usually due to time constraints yeah. or money constraints that they just need to say look we know you're a good composer you've done this before this is what we need and then send it back to us it happens all the time mm -hmm. but then you get these little gems like journey in like the gardens between where you know it's a smaller team and the music uh, composer is working directly with them throughout development and you have these beautiful compositions that actually make sense in the game which yeah. i think is fantastic uh -huh. Uh, one quick big topic I wanted to finish off of was the critical reception of the game. So I was doing a lot of research on it because, like I said, it's on so many different platforms. And the cool thing is it basically um, got an 80% on every single platform it was wow. on. Wow. Give or take a couple like numbers here or there, but it was basically right there. Um, and they were nominated for a ton ton of awards i mean I, I can't list them all out one of the biggest ones i saw was that they won game of the year in australia in 2018 no way yeah, so cool um and then a really fun thing that i found was that they were actually at pax east in 2017 <laughs> where nick was i was he actually was there did you see him i can't remember uh, to be perfectly honest there were so many indie booths and we talked to a lot I of them am. too but I don't remember talking to the Gardens Between, or I don't even remember seeing them. I don't think. Yeah. Um, I will say uh, the reason why, uh, my last little note on this game, I will bring up, because I think it's one of the coolest things that we're talking about small indie development teams. They actually brought on a writer onto their team. Hallelujah. Um, uh, for narrative design, but we talked, there's not a lot of narrative design going, but really to blog the entire process from a third party perspective um so if you actually go on to the gardensbetween.com there's a whole blog section where um her name is brooke mags just completely like took on the entire development process and breaks it down um from start to finish really i, I didn't get too far deep into it because it starts off you know at the finish line but i went pretty far and so cool there are art sketches and um conceptual ideas and i'm really diving deep into the mechanics of the game design so if you are looking for a stronger uh, game design feel onto this game please go check it out i think you're gonna be just that sounds awesome yeah um that's all i got how'd i do yeah no that was great oh, I, it was nice for you to take the wheel uh, <laughs> i appreciated that um, I hope that we could give you guys some insights on how the game works and why we liked it so much. Uh, it was fun to actually pick up a game like this um, after a while and, and be able to really enjoy it. Um, I, the last thing, there's no death counter in this game, unfortunately. There's no, no death. So There is sadness, though. There is Cry a lot of counter, sadness. counter, one for Nick. One for Nick, that's true. I did get stuck. There was one stuck counter. Oh, yeah, and I fixed it. You, well, I, I did need you in the room, but I did figure it out. I, I will say that. Uh, Cry counter, one. Stuck counter, also one. Yeah. I feel like we're going to have a lot of counters going at this point, after your Breath of the Wild counter that we had. Well, I've been Ash. <laughs> and I've been Nick. And, and you've you just been, been leveled up. up.